really get without actually having like huge numbers and super caps and all that stuff. So the format for this I'd like, I'd like to talk for a little bit. Um, if you guys have a direction that you'd like this to sort of go, I'll be watching the lecture chat. And then I'd like to open up maybe half of the time that we have. I don't know if the 20 minutes is going to cut into it or not, but uh, we'll let North figure that out. Um, but I'd like to give at least half the time for Q&A to answer your guys' questions about uh, EPVP, mercenary PVP, mercenary life, the mercenary community, all that sort of stuff. Right now, being a mercenary kind of sucks. Um, Inferno was not kind to mercs. Ironic, considering CCP was supposed to, you know, add in all these features for mercenaries and war deckers and all this stuff. It hasn't really worked out. Um, contracts are down pretty much across the board, uh, I'd say, except for us and the other big um, mercenary group in the Merc Contracts channel, Exhale. Speaking of Merc Contracts, this is like the place to go if you guys are interested in hooking up with the community. Merc Contracts is a channel that was established by myself and the Pit Boss, who used to lead uh, the orphanage. That was a mercenary alliance that now disbanded after Inferno. They just couldn't keep up with the uh, changes, just too much that affected their way of life, so they're gone now. But it was designed to provide employers a place they could find mercenaries that wouldn't scam them. Uh, before Merc Contracts Channel, it was sort of a big problem. Um, you know, these little mercenary groups would come up and they'd be like, hey, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do this job for 250 mil, and then they'd take the money and they would never actually do anything. This really undermined confidence in the market. So, in order to ad address that and make it a little easier for really reputable guys coming up, we created this channel, we listed everybody, and within eight months or so, it pretty much ended Merc contract scamming as we know it. And it also provided a great way to see how many people were in the market. And that number has been in decline. And even a lot of the guys that are listed now have decided to go to Faction Warfare. All the mercenaries, you know, maybe RP-wise were in it for the money. But it really just doesn't pay enough compared to, say, Incursions or Wormhole Space or Faction Warfare that it would replace that income entirely. But on the other hand, you are getting paid to PvP. You're, uh, you don't have to go through, say, grinding a zillion missions to get, like, a, a battleship or something. You can go out there, you can PvP night after night, and at the end of the contract, get, like, 200 mil in your wallet and feel pretty good about that. Every merc handles money differently. Um, a lot of the mercenary alliances will invest it and then sort of like, basically probably a system you guys are familiar with here in EV Diversity. They'll have hangars with ships in the hangars, and people can just take the ships. Um, Noir doesn't really do that because we, as a philosophy of our corp, like to stay mobile, as mobile as possible. So we don't actually have group hangars that would, would require like freighters to move from place to place. Everybody's responsible for their own equipment. And we tend to travel light. So we'll have, uh, you know, maybe three or four ships for a contract. Like, uh, if I was going out to zero zero, like say, curse, I might take an interceptor, um, a logistic ship, and something else. And then that's it for me. And I'll be good for like two weeks. So if you approach things that way, it becomes quite easy to just jump with your own carrier, and then if you have free space, you can offer free space to everybody else, and that's a, so on and so forth. But that's not really normal. <laughs> and I wouldn't even say it's the most efficient, but from the leadership perspective, it's a lot less of a headache, because you don't have to worry about getting freighters together, and you don't have to worry about hangar permissions, and you don't have to worry about corp thefts, and all that kind of stuff. 
So it's a system that works for us. Contracts themselves, uh, they go through the contract manager, which is a player, usually a director, usually the CEO, but not always, who can negotiate with the public on behalf of the corp. So if uh, North Crossroad came to me and he was like, uh, we're, we're having some real trouble with this war deck or we're, we're trying to open up um, an EV, EV University low sec post in this particular area, but we, we just need help getting set up and pushing these pirates out. Uh, he would come talk to me for as far as figuring out how much that would cost, figuring out if there would be any restrictions on length or engagement or anything like that. And he, I would be his point of contact going forward if we actually did enter into a contract. Then we would communicate with one another or someone that he designates. And we'll talk about things like how it's going, if anything needs to be changed midstream, um, if there's some sort of add-on to the end of it, like an extension, and what that would cost. Once you're in the contract... Uh, I would say, I would like to say everybody approaches it differently, but they really don't. Um, being a mercenary, you're sort of bound by your kill board, which is an advantage and a disadvantage. Advantage is it's really easy to go, okay, well, this mark's better than this other mark, because, you know, they're, they're getting more kills, they have a higher efficiency, they're doing more damage to my enemy, and they're not giving them morale boosts in exchange. The downside is, Having to constantly watch your kill board and like worry over every little piece of isk that you're losing and killing can get really stressful and sucky. <laughs> like you can't just go out, say, with a command ship and just run around Empire looking for war targets. Cause if you get ganked, then the rest of your corp has to pick up the difference on that. And it can, it can be rough. Uh, we recently had a contract in Losec where one of our NAR Academy trainees uh, was is one of our newer NAR Academy guys. We were having a court meeting, a NAR only court meeting, to talk about stuff. We talk about uh, a court meeting basically every month to sort of touch base. While that was going on, we're all in one vent channel together. No one's on normal combat comms. He decided to take a very poorly fit harbinger out into low sec in our contract area and run belts. It was a three belt system, which means no one is actually ratting there, but he thought he would go and look anyway. Well, he found a Proteus, and when he communicated it to us via chat, it was like screaming, oh my god, I got a Proteus ratting in a belt, I tackled him, everybody come, everybody come. Yeah, I see. Pam, hot mic. So we were like, ah, okay, Proteus, I guess we'll go. We were all sort of in ships, like sitting at a posse, sitting in the system next door. So we all roll in, and then mid warp, we're like, wait a minute, got a Proteus riding here? And then we landed, and it became quite clear that he didn't tackle a Proteus. Proteus tackled him. <laughs> And like five seconds after we landed, all this stuff decloaked around us and, and everything. And we were like, oh shit. <laughs> we wound up losing a bunch of hacks and a bunch of well-fit, uh, logistic ships. And it put us back pretty far. Our contract went from like 90% efficiency for the week to 45% efficiency for the week with a pretty hefty ISK deficit. We had to kill, I think it was about 4 billion ISK maybe a little less, to get it back to a more sensible uh, number, like 70, 75. I was not pleased. <laughs> and that week sucked. Um, FCs had to work double time. We had to grind a lot of structures. It just wasn't fun. But on the other hand, you've got contracts that give you some of the best fights you'll ever have. We just had one last night, as a matter of fact, it was pretty awesome. Um, so it's it's a mixed bag. You gotta take the job, you gotta do the job no matter where it takes you. 
Unlike normal Eve, you can't afford to take a long view. You only have a week or two, maybe a month, if you're lucky, to achieve the desired result. And uh, you can't really take it like just on fun. Like If you start to lose, you can't just go, oh, all right, well, we'll try something else. You have to stick with it. If that pass doesn't go down, if the enemy manages to save it, you're contracted to kill it, you have to try again. Even if you lost more isk than the contract was worth just trying. That's sort of the way it is. <laughs> Zardata asks, how did you handle the trainee? Well, um, he was yelled at for sure. He was given till the end of the contract to try to make up for it. And this guy in particular... Jesus Christ, Pim! <laughs> Jesus. Uh, this particular trainee was not the first issue we had with him, to give you guys some context. He was very uh, disruptive on comms at times. Was not a quick learner by any means. Um, Eve University is a much more accepting place than Noir. <laughs> but we have Noir Academy for people who either we're not, we don't know personally, or they're new to the game and they need training. So it's sort of a place that you go in, we see how you are, and then if you need training, we give it to you. If you don't, you just move right into Noir within a month. He needed more training than others, and the training he was given was not sticking. And, you know, you need to learn fast. You need to be able to learn from your mistakes. You need to be able to take feedback. And if you can't do those things, it's really hard to teach those things. So we were already sort of going, eh, this guy. And then this thing happened. We gave him until the end of the week to see if he could really put in a hero's effort to try to turn things around. And in our estimation, he did not. And he was expelled from our academy following. He wound up joining one of our blues. I have no idea what he's doing now. And I don't really care. I assume he's doing okay since he didn't get kicked out of there yet. <laughs> Tactics. Uh, there are a couple good tactics that mercenaries will use to be able to take on these hard-hitting contracts. In Empire, there's really two ways to go about it. One, be extremely mobile. Do what's called hunter killing, which is uh, what Noir is mostly about. You'll take interceptors, vagabonds, scimitars, things like that. And you'll hit Empire, and you'll run, like, locator agents. You'll check all the trade hubs. You'll check all the common missioning spots. You'll run the enemy kill board for intel, find out, um, you know, if they've lost any haulers full of stuff in low sec. Maybe there's a POS near there. We go and send scouts to that area, and we map it all out, look for their towers. We'll follow them around for a while and see if they go into a wormhole. If we know they have a wormhole. It's usually pretty easy to get that information. Not easy in the in the sense that it looks like a piece of cake, but it's certainly not hard. You just follow people around. You wait for them to disappear. You run your locator agent. If it confirms they're in a wormhole, you just start probing every system within three or four of where they were last spotted. Eventually, you'll find it. And of course, when you find it, you slip as many probers as you can, and then you get your fleet in there and start doing some damage. The other side of things is to go with a more, uh, I would say, tanky DPS setup. This is commonly used by mercenary corps that favor station camping. They'll have things like faction battleships and uh, really high EHP Tech 3s, and they'll pair them up with neutral logistics and try to bait a fight with this really expensive-looking ship and then they'll undock or warp in more expensive ships and then use these neutral characters that the war targets may or may not know about to provide surprise reps. We're not too into that in particular, but it works for a lot of mercs, and uh, it's certainly a valid tactic, and <laughs> it'll be interesting to see 
what happens to that tactic after the changes coming up in retribution with regards to neutral repping and all that stuff. We'll see. Now, and there's a third one, which is black ops and bombing. And this applies particularly to zero zero. At the moment, only two alliances really do it, which is us and Vengeance Inc. And we're pretty new to the scene. Vengeance specializes in bombers, particularly bombing run bombers. You may know them from the chat channel Bombers Bar or any of the articles on Eve News 24 or Mitani.com showcasing their bomb runs. They're pretty good at what they do. And they've got a lot of people that are just in it for fun, and they have a very good organization which allows them to sort of incorporate these people that aren't really part of their corp, aren't really part of their regular membership, but they can pick them up off the street and incorporate them into their fleets, get them the bookmarks they need, get them the bombs they need, and get them on target, which is pretty cool. The other end of it is Black Ops, which puts a whole bunch of stealth bombers on a Black Ops battleship. You run a Rapier or an Arazu around whatever system you're targeting. And as soon as you catch something, you activate the bridge and bring all the bombers in. has the advantage of concealing your numbers a little bit. And usually your enemy will figure out where you're basing eventually. But the real advantage is you don't have to expose your fleet all the time. You know, you can go, oh, this Drake is obvious bait. I'm just going to point it and web it and use my drones on it and see what happens. If it's not doing anything, then maybe I'll pop my Sino. As opposed to if your entire fleet's roaming around, Drake lands, maybe it points a stealth bomber, maybe it pops a Sino and like all kinds of interceptors fly out of it. It's just a problem. So not having that, concealing your numbers, keeping your pilots sort of centrally located where they can easily go AFK, come back, and still be right with the fight. It's got a lot of advantages for a zero zero Merc. And it also lets you kill a target in, like, 15 seconds and warp away, which is great. <laughs> great if they're trying to warp in, like, some kind of response fleet. You can just lull, warp away, cloak, jump out, and it's like you were never there, except they have a dead ship and you have something shiny on your kill board. Pretty much all I had in mind to talk about straight away, so let's get into some questions here. And uh, if I didn't cover something that you wanted me to talk about, make that your question, and I'll be sure to go on about it for quite a while. <laughs> okay, I'm scrolling up here in lecture. Let's see, a question from Jutara Hake. Sorry if I uh, mangle any of your names here. With the upcoming changes to GCC, etc., and CCP looking at bounties, will Merc work get better? It may. Uh, bounties for sure will make Merking interesting, but the real boon to Merking is when they set up private bounties, which will not be coming in the winter release, but will hopefully be an iteration they add on soon after, where you can not only put a bounty of, say, $5 billion on Goonswarm, but you can put a bounty of $5 billion on Goonswarm that only one corp can claim, or a set of corps can claim. This will give the mercenaries confidence that when they spend all the money to war deck Goonswarm, they can actually earn that money back and then some by doing these bounties. I don't know with confidence whether or not it will replace traditional contract fees entirely, but it could be a nice little uh, boost, definitely. Chrysanthemum of Throne wants to know how Raz Talon is doing. I haven't had a problem with him yet. Uh, he's relatively new, so I think I only worked with him a little bit yesterday. But he seemed like a nice guy. Max Riddick, how often do you use locator agents? In Empire, tons. Um, especially if the group that we're fighting is not centrally located. If they're a really big alliance, like 500 or so, it's really common for them not to be in one spot. You might have a mining op in one place, you might have a mission in another place. Maybe they have some zero zero, so there's like a, a route between their zero zero and the nearest trade hub. That might get you a lot of targets. But it might not get you everything. So if things are quiet, 
you just look for somebody that's logged on. Information you can get from Ifu is like their entire corp. You just add them all to your buddy list. Takes a while, but it's worth it. See who's online. If you can't figure out where the one dude is, he's not in the usual uh, haunts like Jita, Amar, places in between common missioning areas. If he's not there, well, find the nearest locator agent, run it. And if he's 40 jumps away or whatever, you go on a little road trip. Hop in some interceptors and some tier 3 battle cruisers and start rolling out there. Maybe you get the kill, maybe you just camp him, but it's better than doing nothing. Zardata, how much intel do you gather before attacking? Um, every merc does it a little differently. Uh, some mercs will even slip in characters into their target's corp so they can get inside information on what's going on where and all that sort of stuff. Nora doesn't really go for that. We're not too into the metagame. We'll actually not do too much intel before attacking. Um, and we'll do like killboard scrapes and killboard analysis, but we won't like shadow them around for a week or so. Usually our employers don't want us to wait. So we just sort of go with it. Um, for zero zero targets, it can be pretty easy to know where they are. And killboards can tell you a lot can tell you their fleets they like to fly, what their biggest fleet is, who their friends are, where they're active besides their headquarter areas. Um, could even tell you who their FCs are if you see like they're really active players, primary them first. So there's a lot that can be done without spending actual time flying around following people. Sometimes you have to, particularly with wormholes. Like, there's just no way to get that info without shadowing their characters. So that can take time. But unless we have to do something like that, we'd usually just go with it. I already touched on Mark Q's question a little bit. Uh, North Crossroad, in Sav00, do you put a pass? We do not. Um, Noir is still on the small side. The main corp has like 60, 65. Um, and then the NOR Academy guys, we can't always count on them coming along on contract with us. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Depends on where they're at in their, uh, in their program. So compare those numbers to like the hundreds that SOV00 guys can throw out on a consistent basis. And we just don't have enough, uh, enough manpower to defend a tower if we were to put one down. So it would really just be a lost mail waiting to happen. Instead, we rely on ships that don't really need a pass. So interceptors, you know, you can warp around instantly. So you just do that for 15 minutes. You wait till your aggression timer is gone if, if you had one in the first place, and then you just log off in space. Same thing with stealth bombers, same thing with recons. Uh, cloaking hacks, cloaking battle cruisers, black ops battleships, etc. Don't bother with passes, just log in space. All you have to do is make sure that you can move around or cloak for 15 minutes to remove your aggression timer, and then you're just gone. Admittedly, you can't switch your ship easily. You'd need a wormhole to do that, but it works for us. What does a typical Merc contract run for an Empire vs. Zero Zero group? This is from Little Probist, or Lil Probist. It varies wildly on the target and the Merc. Um, say for Noir, to war deck, uh, 500 man, say Zero Zero Alliance, you might be talking about 2, 2.5 billion isk a week at the moment. If it's a bigger contract, it might charge a little more. If it looks like it'll be a harder contract, we'll charge a little more. If we haven't done work in a while and we're just looking for a contract, we might offer a little less to make sure that we get it. If it's zero zero work, it'll definitely be a little bit more. You're looking at like three, four, maybe even five bill, depending how deep it is or who the targets are. In the grand scheme of things, it's not that much money, but it provides our pilots with enough income that they can grow their wallets, even if they lose a ship or two, which is important. 
Pakal says, came in late. Did you talk about your corpse structure? Not really. Um, Noir's corpse structure is relatively flat compared to most zero zero alliances. Yeah, there's me at the top. I'm, I'm the boss. I founded the company. I do the contracts. I do the PR for the most part. So I do a lot of high-level management stuff. I do a lot of diplomacy. I do a lot of contract negotiation. I do a lot of long-term strategizing, deal-making, thinking, planning, FCing, etc. And I also fly around in PvP when I can. <laughs> um, right below me, I've got a leadership team, a bunch of directors, and they do a really good job. Um, I've got two directors for the European Union time zone, two directors for the U.S. time zone, and I've got a director for U.S., a director for EU, for NOR Academy, a.k.a. the head trainers for there. Right below that is like a sub-leadership team that handle very specific tasks, like fueling passes, like handling our in-game fittings management and third-party tools, like handling our web development and IT stuff. Um, those roles are like just under directors. Oh, and our loot guy. Guy that sells loot for us. All our loot goes into the contract pays. So we need to collect it centrally and sell it centrally. So guy that has a lot of time to play with market orders and spam contracts and Jita and that stuff to make sure our loot gets sold in a timely fashion. That's a very important thing for us. So we have a guy that focuses just on that. And we have a a wormhole, so we have a guide that manages our wormhole space, coordinates whose passes go where, capital ship building, all that sort of stuff. After that, it's flat. Everybody's on the same page. Literally everyone in the corp could FC if they wanted to. We tend to have a few regulars. These regulars don't really want to be regulars for the most part, so we're always encouraging new people to step up and do it and learn and FCing is a required portion of learning in our academy. You must have see at least one op in order to graduate, preferably more. So definitely learning, getting more people have seen is a very important aspect of our training program, important aspect of our corp. We don't have a certified FC program or an FC list or anything of that nature. It's just whoever's around, you know, if I log on, and I want to FC, few people will object. I'm one of the more experienced ones. And, hey, you can tell me now. Come on. <laughs> well, um, if I don't feel like it, though, I'm like, yeah, I'm not FCing tonight. You do it. And then they'll have a quick powwow about who wants to go FC. And if they can't figure it out, I'll usually just pick somebody and make them do it. And whoever I pick will usually be either the least experienced person, if we don't have to bust ass that week, or the most experienced person. If we are in trouble that week and we need to bust the ass. I hope that answered your question. If not, uh, feel free to do a follow on Pekel. Max Riddick asks, what type of contracts do you get? Destroy as many war targets you can, achieve a specific goal. Is there a point where you render a contract and fail it? We get pretty much every contract. I would say the only contract types we nor will not do is like assassination stuff. And that's just because there's really no money in it right now. And that'll change with bounty hunting perhaps and sellable kill rights. At the moment, it's just not worth the huge sec hit that you get. Because if you're going to pod someone, which is what these assassination contracts almost always involve, you've got to kill their ship and pod them. You're talking about enough people in the corp taking a high sec sec ganking hit to kill their ship, and then one dude has to take like a negative three for a high sec pod kill. It takes forever to get that sec back, so it's really not worth the time. But we'll do war decks. Um, we'll attack specific systems like camp a pipe, camp a region. Um, we'll asset deny a region which is where we're not really going for kills necessarily, but more of just a general annoyance, prevent them from accessing their space. 
materially, this isn't super different than a normal zero zero contract for us, but it'll maybe involve more AFK camping and things like that as opposed to roaming around actively looking for whatever target we can find. We'll spend more time centrally located in their hive activity systems and preventing them from using those. Kills help with this, but the goal is slightly different. Um, we do surveillance recon, which is, like I said, following people around, uh, maybe doing our normal intel prep, but providing it to the employer specifically. It could be identifying a POS, locating a wormhole, things like that. POS destruction, these are very much goal-based contracts. This POS must die. Same thing with POS saves. Please keep this POS alive. Um, POS destruction, they really don't care as long as it gets done. We've had a lot of employers that have hired us for this be very understanding, if, especially if it's not our fault. The POS does not die. Like, the... uh the POS turns out to be a pandemic legion alt corp. That's happened. <laughs> and they're like bringing in like dozens of carriers to rep it. Well, the employer is like, yeah, sorry about that. Um, sometimes we're paired up with another Merc unit that doesn't really come through. Um, not all Mercs are created equal. Some are much more reliable than others. In cases like that, usually the employer has been pretty cool with us because we are reliable. We do put up the numbers. We do put up the effort. And if he was expecting the Southern Merc Corp to help us out with that and they don't, usually he's pretty cool if things do not go right because of their negligence. He thankfully holds them responsible, not us, which is nice. Um, custom, c- custom office kill saves pretty much the same as a pass. Um, but it's a customs office. It's a little cheaper, a little quicker, and uh, depending on what the employer wants, you know, usually they'll want their own customs office anchored, but not always. And occasionally we'll get a customs office out of the gate, out of the deal. Or sometimes the local pirate will come in and make it a three-way, and they'll get the customs office. Usually the employer won't care as long as the uh, target is dead, unless they specifically request otherwise and provide the money for anchoring a new one. We'll either do it ourselves or just leave it up to the market to decide. Scouting escort. Take one thing from one place, move it to another place. Usually this is a freighter or an orca. Probably our biggest and best known escorts were escorting Eve's largest supply of narcotics from a system in Losec to Jita for sale. That was uh, done by Hedonistic Imperative. As the largest drug run to date, and we were fighting the customs office, not the customs office, the uh, customs patrols on the gates and protecting the freighters from other players as well. It was quite a quite a good deal of fun. <laughs> and the other one would be moving a freighter like twenty something jumps into zero zero in what the goons then called Fortress Delve after they took Delve away from Bob. That was interesting. <laughs> I do not recommend moving freighters through zero zero, but if you have to do it, you know, there are ways. We do some training contracts, either opposing force, where we'll war deck you or something like that, and it'll be like a normal war deck, except we're talking to your leadership, we're making sure that it's only limited to tech one ships or something like that focusing on tactics and learning rather than inflicting a lot of damage. And we provide a lot of feedback on fights afterward. Cadre training is where you fly with us. We'll usually take you to a region where you don't have a lot of standings. Everybody gets into one fleet. We'll join a chat channel. You use the same comms. And basically for a week, our FCs provide you with as much PvP as we possibly can. Just sheer volume of hands-on experience and as much feedback as we can after those ops are over. We got some custom contracts. If, you know, you want to do something that doesn't really fit anywhere else, you know, this is sort of the catch-all term for that. Um, I don't know, like a good example would be... I 
Oh, we had to join an alliance once. This was way back called Tread Alliance. They were an alliance in Providence that was looking to raise their standing amongst other alliances in Providence. And we got hired to boost their kill board stats so that they looked a little more credible to CVA and the other Providence guys. That didn't really fit anywhere, so we threw in the custom. And we offer some uh, specific services, corporation expansion, alliance creation. That's done by me personally. Same thing with consulting, strategic planning, either on campaigns, your corporation, um, PvP in general, POS defense. We do all that sort of stuff. And you can bring us in as a third party, specifically me, if you have to trade a super cap or trade a system or you need some problem mediated. We're glad to help with that. Our most common request is probably war decks or assassinations. But, of course, we don't do assassinations, so war decks are the only request that will honor. Unfortunately for a lot of people, NAR has a rule. We will not war deck a set of targets that is smaller than us. Um, so if you want a small alliance or a small corp war deck, you have to pair them with a big one or just hire us against the big alliance. So I think the ceiling right now is like 125. We're not going to go to war against less than 125 targets. It's just boring. So you got to hire us against big guys or not at all. We love zero zero though. Wish we would do more of it. Zardata wants to know what was our favorite contract, what was our biggest loss, and have you ever hired another Merc to help you with a contract? Uh, my favorite contract. That's tough. I have to say my favorite contract was our contract against Providence. When AAA was invading them, we got hired against Southern Providence. <coughs> and in Providence was basically divided in half. Uh, Northern Providence, I think it was Northern Providence? Northern Providence is where we were at, sorry. Southern Providence was AAA and all those guys doing their invading stuff. Southern Pro or Northern Providence was ours. And it was pretty much pretty cleanly divided in half as to what was our responsibility and what was their open roaming territory. And triple, it was so good. One time we had a six jump roam. It was just supposed to be a little, hey, we'll go to this entrance system and then we'll come back. Six jump roam. Took us two hours to get from one end of it to the other. Because we just kept running into things to kill and fight. It was just amazing. Like, we would jump, and then the guy behind us, who still had aggro, was like, hey, wait a minute, there's a drake coming behind us. And we'd be like, oh, reapers the gate. Rinse and repeat that for two hours. <laughs> Doesn't get more awesome than that. Um, it was one of our highest damage contracts, too, which is cool. Our biggest loss uh, on a contract, our biggest loss, that's a toughie. I actually am not entirely sure. We've lost a couple capital ships. I think our biggest would be one time we were in low sec hitting a tower, and we lost, uh, I think it was two dreadnoughts or a dread and a carrier or something like that. That definitely sucked. We killed the tower, eventually. It was a very costly contract. We did not make a profit on that at all. <laughs> have we ever hired another merc to help with a contract? We have asked other people to help with our contracts, usually blues or friends or enemies that the guys were hitting. I don't think we've ever actually hired another merc. We've tried a couple times. But the two or three times I'm thinking of, the mercs never actually showed up for that. And most of the other times we had to work with other mercenary groups, it was the employer who arranged it ahead of time. So I, uh, I might be wrong. There might be one or two occasions, but they're not coming. Have I heard about Retirement Club and what is our relationship with them? I have heard of the Retirement Club. And my relationship with them is 
I'm friends with some of the Evolution guys, which is one of the big corps in that alliance. Um, Sir Moly's wife is actually a friend of mine from Eve back in like 2008. Um, we became friends when her alliance got attacked by Mercenary Coalition. Our alliances were one of the few to help try to defend that space. Started up a friendship we kept up for a while. Um, we met at a science fiction convention, hung out, became real life friends. She got into a relationship with Molly. Molly moved over here. Turns out they live like 45 minutes from my house. <laughs> so they invite me to like the barbecues and stuff like that. But we don't really have any in-game relationship. I don't think I've ever flown in a fleet with any of them. Not that it wouldn't be fun. Most memorable contract. Well, I already said Pravi. I'd say the only other truly memorable one would be period basis when you're fighting Laguina Romana, which was a Romanian alliance down in period basis, which is like the edge of space, as far south as you can possibly go, maybe 60 jumps from Empire. And despite it being that deep, we actually beat out our Providence contract in terms of one week's damage record. It was just an incredible amount of PvP in cut across maybe four, five systems. You know, a lot of awesome PvP, some capital ship kills, some officer fit ships killed. It's pretty, pretty great. But as far as historic significance, it's just a little bit below the Providence contract, which is why I went with a Provi as my fave. Bad contract? I don't know. We had a contract against the Phoenix Tribe. It was one of our first war decks. Certainly our first hard war deck. And our our asses just kept getting beat repeatedly. Like, we couldn't get kills on these guys to save our lives. The corp was maybe six people strong at the time. Phoenix Tribe had maybe 12 guys. And they were all veteran players. They had lived in this area for the longest time. They had intel everywhere. They had better fit ships than we could possibly field. And we just kept getting owned. Like, we, there was nothing we could do. <laughs> but we had to keep trying. And we did. And we just got buried. Uh, a lot of our early, not a lot, but two or three of our early contracts were like that. It took us a bit to really get our feet under us as far as learning how to fight above our weight and all that stuff. Eventually we did it, and we really took to it. How much would it cost for your cost to hire you to grind UMED into the dirt? I have no idea who that is. Well, oh, uh, details for a, above. A quick explanation. It's our current uh, grief war deck. Uh, from a small corp. Yeah, they're too small for us. Sorry, bro. Question from Eugen Moon. Do you ever turn on a customer after completion for a contract? For example, save our pass, and after a while you come back and take it because you know you can. Not a nice thing to do. Just nothing against the rules on it. You know? Uh, we never... We never break our contract, so if you hire us, we'll never take like a larger payment, give your name to the target, and then take a war deck against you, or we'll never come save your tower, and then they offer us a bigger amount of money, and then we just, instead of saving it, turn around and kill it. That doesn't happen. But you're either our customer or you're not. You know, you're either our friend or you're just some dude. And if you're not paying us money, you're just some dude. And if someone else pays us money, then some, any dude can become a target. So if you pay us to save your tower, and we do it, and then next week, the same guys that attacked it are like, hey, remember that tower you saved? Well, if we were going to attack it again, would you accept, like, X amount of money to help us? If we weren't busy, if the contract looked good, if the price was right, sure, absolutely. If you didn't want that to happen, Mr. Poss owner, maybe you should have paid us a retainer. <laughs> you know, I'll, 
we'll be real nice to you for money, but we're not nice people, generally speaking. You have to pay us to be nice. <laughs> you know? And if you're if your enemies just happen to uh get the jump on you, it's first come, first serve. Now once we have their money, they get the same level of protection that you had. You know, you can't give us a larger amount and expect us to turn on them. Doesn't work that way. We accept the contract and we'll stick to the contract. But if you don't have a contract with us, you're just another neutral. You're just another potential target. How about cost for Team Liquid? Another war deck. Just disregard. Just Just disregard. A bunch of team liquid stuff. Question from North Crossroad. How often do you use caps? Do you use super caps? We'll use carriers a little bit, especially for triage. But we don't use caps too commonly because our cap fleet is very small compared to the rest of EVE. And because we have sort of a running mini feud-ish thing with Pandemic Legion. Not that we're really credible competition for them, and not that they even see us that way, but they do like to pick on us quite a bit. So I think pretty much every low sec capital ship deployment in the last two to three years, with a few exceptions maybe, has had Pandemic Legion like drop on it or harass it in one way or another. Um, so we're very careful about deploying cap ships, you know. Especially because they're really embarrassing losses when they die. They're super expensive. So that that's an issue. Do we use super caps? Sometimes. Uh, we have them. Uh, a couple motherships. I've used them to, like, grind structures when things are really quiet. We've never actually used them in combat combat. Again, because our super cap fleet is really small compared to everybody else's, so... You're not really in a good position to throw them out there where they're in real jeopardy. But someday we'd like to have a bigger one, and you got to start somewhere. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Phelan Keldon asks, or Keldian asks, if someone was interested in joining Nor Academy, how much ISK would you suggest them having ready? Also, are there specific ships they should be able to fly on joining? The ISK question is really tough. It depends on what size ship that you really are in. If you're a frigate pilot, 500 mil can go a long way. If you can fly Tech 3s, you know, 500 mil isn't a lot of money. So I would say be able to replace all of your ships that you normally fly. I'd say be able to replace them at least three times. And that's a pretty good rule of thumb. So if you can fly a scimitar, if you like logistic ships, you know, be able to afford three scimitars if you had to. You probably won't. But, oh, and scimitars get replaced when you graduate to Noir anyway. But in terms of an ISK buffer, that's pretty good. That'll also give you, like, extra ISK if you need to buy another one because, you know, your other scimitar is, like, half a world away and you don't have time to fly back and get it. Well, now you can just buy another one off the market. Something like that. Ships that you think you should be able to fly on joining? Uh, it's a toughie, especially with the new frigate changes. Like, frigates are really useful now in a way they weren't before. So if you can fly a Condor, if you can fly an Atron, you're much more useful now than you ever were before. So, I would say, any ship would be fine. You know, if you're in a, uh, like, if you really want to be a DPS pilot, I would say make sure that you can actually fly proper DPS ships before joining. If you can only fly frigates, you know, we have assault frigates in our fleets sometimes, but they're not commonly used. We much more favor interceptors and things like that. So if you want to be a tackler, make sure you can fly a scepter or the T1 equivalent. Now, before you graduate, you must be able to fly at least one of the Tech 2 ships.
So even if you join with a Tech 1 pilot, you have to have a T2 ship. That's because those are so useful for what we do. The ability to point without being pointed is priceless. North Crossword asks, any advices to people that want to start a Merc Corp? Put the work in. Um, starting a Merc Corp isn't like starting a missioning corp. You know, you start a mission corp, maybe bring your friends in. You don't have to compete against anybody. Nobody has to take you seriously. If you want to start as a Merc, there's a market. That market's competitive. People are looking as to why they should hire you over somebody else. And if you don't have a good answer for that, then why are you doing it? So your corp should be, first of all, get your PvP skills up. That's the first thing. People need to believe you're credible in order to join your corp and certainly to hire you. So you should have FC experience, lots of it. You should have a pretty good kill record. You should be able to go, look, I'm an experienced PvPer. I've led fleets. I know what I'm doing. You should join my corp and fly with me. You should hire me. I can get it done. Next, put the time into your corp to make it look the part. Get a kill board set up. You know, do not... I've seen a couple people on Crime and Punishment advertise, hey, I'm a merc now, you know. my Hire my corp for this thing. They don't have a kill board. If they do have a kill board, it's very generic looking. They clearly didn't put any work into designing it. And it's got, like, less than a dozen kills on it. No one will hire you. And all the other mercs will not take you seriously. Get your kill board together. Populate it. Run around. Start building up a, hey, look, we've got, like, 100 kills. Our efficiency is 80%. That starts to look pretty good. Get some people to join is probably the next step. You can take corp or take contracts as one person. But it's certainly easier if you've got a friend. And I guess the next step is, after all that, you know, do a little research on the market. Figure out if normal war decks are being over or underserved. If there are corps already out there that are taking mercenary war deck contracts and they're not getting enough contracts to keep them going, you should know about that ahead of time because... Why would I enter a market that's already saturated? There's no reason for people to pick you over these other people. They have more experience. They have bigger member bases. You need to come up with a unique pitch for your corp. Or join something where there's more demand than there are people to fulfill it. An example like that would be assassination contracts. If you specialized your corp in assassination contracts, you would get tons of work because there is no one that's doing it. This will probably change in retribution. But for right now, it's just not. If you can find a way to make that work, and it's what you enjoy doing, you'll make a lot of money at it. If you do Empire War Decks, you probably won't. Certainly, if you do low sec or, or zero zero work, you definitely won't. If you do wormhole work, you better be big enough to compete with guys like us and guys like Exhale who can field 30-man fleets minimum. If you can't do that, then you can't compete there. So don't do it. <laughs> you just need to figure out where you can fit and then grow your corp. And then, you know, as your corp gets bigger, maybe you can take on more stuff or make plays for different parts of the market. But definitely put the work in ahead of time. Get your website looking nice. Get your kill board looking nice. Um, advertise on crime and punishment. Track your contracts with a contract history so you can build some credibility. Get yourself listed in Merc Contracts channel and just get out there and, and pound it. It is a lot of work, not going to lie. Regus Ferios asked, do you have any people that fly cheap ships, i.e. T1 frigates and cruisers? We have some. It's rare that that's the best choice, but sometimes it is. Um, like a Punisher is a pretty good heavy tackler for an armor fleet. I wouldn't turn a Punisher away. With the uh, upcoming changes to the electronic warfare frigates, the Tech 1 ones, 
they're going to be better than the electronic attack frigates, except for the Kitsune, I think. <clears throat> so they will definitely be used much more heavily. But for the most part, you know, if I got a guy, he can fly a, a, a tornado with Tech 2 water cannons. I'm probably not going to put him in a Condor unless I really need tackle. And if I do really need tackle, I would probably put him in an interceptor, not a condor, so he has that extra point range and extra speed and extra durability. Chrysanthemum Throne asks blackbirds. No, not for us. <laughs> Other mercs, yes. We just don't use them. Um, they're going to get quite a buff in the retribution patch. We probably will start using them after that. But for right now, they're just too slow and too weakly tanked to fit in our fleets. Would much rather have a cheaper frigate, like a Griffin, a more mobile ship, like a Katsune, a more durable mid-range ship, like a Rook, or a super durable, massive tank ship, like an ECM Tengu, which I just used yesterday to fantastic effect. <laughs> it was brilliant. No one suspects the ECM Tengu. Marku Laksonen, Laksonen asks, Is there or will there be with Retribution room for solo bounty hunting? Is that a realistic way to support yourself, or do you need to be part of Corp? Right now, no. After Retribution? Possibly. Um, I don't, I'm not confident enough to say support yourself, as in you could do it full time and nothing else. But I think you could probably do a go of it by yourself, especially with kill rights and the way they're gonna work now. Definitely being in a corp helps. But if you, if you like the idea of being like a solo bounty hunter dude, after retribution it's gonna be a viable play style, at least to supplement your existing income. It'll really depend how much people buy into the new bounty system as to whether or not it can be a full-time thing. If it's as they are currently, no. If it's as CCP and to an extent the CSM are hoping, with people putting bounties on everybody for just about any reason, with bounty buttons on the forums and all that stuff, maybe you could. There's going to be a lot of this being put on people's heads. So go out there and claim some. Marlon Spike von Krendraven asks, thoughts on the upcoming Logi frigates? They're fantastic. They're going to be one of the best Tech 1 frigates you could possibly bring on fleets like ours. Because everybody needs more Logi. Like, you really can't have enough. So, if you can't fly an interceptor, if you can't fly, or you don't really have good electronic warfare skills, or maybe we just don't need more electronic warfare, I would definitely stick somebody in a, in a logistic frigate or one of the upcoming logistic cruisers in a heartbeat. Especially if you wanted to become a more experienced logistic pilot, it's worth it to take a short hit on like, oh, I don't have enough ECM in this fleet. If I can get a logistic frigate pilot good enough that it becomes a logistic cruiser pilot, to becomes a T2 logistic pilot, to becomes a triage carrier pilot, you know, like, those pilots are super valuable for a corp like mine. So I want to invest in their development and their training. Whew. Well, I think that's about an hour. I will do a last call for questions and lecture. And then I will plug Noir's shit. And then I will leave you be. Jo Johan Wes asks, what background do most of your pilots come from? Low-sec pirates, null-sec dwellers, or high SP characters coming over from PVE? I'd say it's a pretty noir proper direct recruitment. It's almost all null-sec dwellers. The occasional pirate that'll fix his sec, but it's much rarer. Most of noir academies guys come from Mid-level null-sec dwellers, like they've done it, they've done some PvP, but haven't really done a lot of FCing yet. Or they're high SP characters that are PvEing, or their players just starting, for the most part. 
Aaron Dar, how do you keep people logging on and not have it become a job? Frankly, I wish it was a job. Somebody pay me to do this. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I don't mind it. Having a leadership team around you really helps. If I had to do literally everything myself, like in a non-ironic way, I would probably burn out a long time ago. So it helps to have a corp that wants to be there with people that want to help, to have a strong identity that people like to be a part of and want to see succeed. <clears throat> and other than that, just keeping things interesting, making sure the contracts you're taking are interesting, making sure that it's not all work, that you do something for fun every once in a while. Pretty much it. Best flyer, what do you do between jobs? Random PvP rooms? Question mark. Yep, we do random PvP rooms. We'll also grind incursions. We have a wormhole that we can chill in. Uh, but most people do incursions or random PvP. In between contracts, I really don't care what people do. They could play League of Legends for a week. I wouldn't care. Uh, I'd probably be playing League of Legends for a week. And then once we do get a contract, everybody sort of snaps back to attention. If they were goofing off in PvP earlier, like derping faction frigates and all that kind of stuff, they usually smarten up pretty quick. Then we go and do our thing, and then we go relax again. All right, guys, thanks for turning up. It was a really, really good uh, conversation. Really good questions. I'm glad I had enough material to cover the hour. <laughs> um, before I go, I am going to take this opportunity to shamelessly self-promote myself. <laughs> uh, you can check out Noir at www.noirmerch.com. And there you can find information on Noir. You can find information on Noir Academy. Unistas are welcome if you want sort of a master's degree in PvP. Um, full disclosure, though, when you join Noir Academy, it is, it's not a general PvP training course like Agony. It's a Noir PvP training course. We expect people to join after. We're grooming you to join after. We're teaching you not just how to PvP. We're teaching you our culture. And if you just want to hear more stuff about mercenaries in general, you can check out our mercenary podcast, Declarations of War. www.declarationsofwar.com. It's updated about every two weeks. You, you know, that's pretty good stuff. We'll have lots of special guests. We'll talk about mercenary life. We'll talk about Zero Zero Politics, we'll talk about wormhole politics, we'll talk about news and current events, and we'll talk about stuff that's going on in the CSM. Being a CSM member, a lot of good info there. And there's a lot of funny stuff too. We got songs, dramatic readings, um, we'll have like rotating segments, like we'll talk about maybe the history of our corp, we'll talk about a particular ship or tactic and give you like a fittings masterclass on that sort of thing. We've got a lot of segments that we swap in and out in addition to our regular stuff. And right now, I highly recommend it because we have an interview with Celine, who is the CSM chairman, but more importantly, the founder and executor contract manager and one of the top FCs for probably the famous, most famous mercenary group in Eve's entire history. Mercenary Coalition. Yes, Chris Anthem, and that guy. And he talks about everything. He talks about how MC got founded, all their big contracts, what it was like with Bob, what it was like invading all these different regions, what Eve was like before you joined, considering he was at beta, um, and just the evolution of the game, where it's going, life in Pandemic Legion, all that stuff. It's fantastic. So, I highly encourage you to check that out. Vote in our poll. Leave comments on the site. Subscribe. All that good stuff. And I'm done. <laughs>